right, Time Zero Part Two. So Time Zero Part One was the setup, and this this is the part where we get to the um, meat of the story. One, we have assistance from past people who are famous. Yeah, Samuel Clemens. There's several other uh, characters who are more minor than that. But um, overall, this one has a lot more guest characters that are just like normal people from the past. And only a few um, Enterprise crew members for uh, random uh, extras so in the first part we found out what the davidians were doing now we're here to figure out how to stop them from doing that and there's several things about this that get interesting one of them is that you need to create a phase discrimination effect on your photon torpedoes when firing photon torpedoes at Davidians, apparently. Oh, and they also mentioned that the phase discrimination required for uh, getting this stuff to work is apparently 0 0.047 because, sure, why not? Anyways, so the basic gist of it is that the Davidians came to Earth in a time and place where there was a cholera epidemic. And that said cholera epidemic was the um, cover so that people wouldn't realize that Davidians were going around killing everyone. They, The medical personnel of the time just didn't have the ability to tell the difference between someone having their neural energy drained and someone dying of cholera. Or that's the idea the story is going with anyways. To be honest, the whole neural energy drain thing doesn't leave external injuries. The person does kind of look like they died of some sort of sickness. But whatever. Anyways... Now, this is where it gets to the interesting part of the time paradox, because we started by um, finding Data's head in a cavern on Earth. Well, obviously we're going to have to end the story with leaving Data's head in that same cavern. But how are we going to get to that? Hmm. Uh, anyway, um... There's a lot of stuff dealing with the past people because they need to find the Davidians who are in the past and make them stop being in the past because simply cutting off their ability to return to Davidia isn't enough to prevent them from killing people. So one of those things that they did was, you know, Looking for people with an Ophidian cane. Because the Ophidian cane is the most distinctive relic that the Davidians brought with them from Davidia. It's something they can't properly disguise. I mean, yes, it takes on a form that doesn't immediately stick out, but it takes on a form that's still recognizable. Because, again, it looks like this. 
it can't stop looking like this. It, it turns into a mundane looking form, but it's not an ordinary mundane looking form. It's an out of the ordinary one. Now, when it's active and attempting to uh, generate a time portal, then it does this. This is just the way it looks when it's um, not uh, hiding. Now, the origin of Ophidians is something that is completely unknown. The only thing we know about this is that the Davidians have them. <laughs> We don't genuinely know if they come from Davidia, even. We don't know if it's a naturally occurring life form on Davidia or some sort of technological um, creation that's a um, bioengineered living tool. Because, well, Star Trek has gone there. Not a sentient tool. But it's a living tool, anyways. <sighs> and yeah, Picard was able to, to do it and, and uh, return to uh, Davidia. This is another thing about this that is never explained and quite frankly confusing. Why does the method of time travel the Davidians use uh, with the, all of this triolic wave manipulation, why does it require them to link two caves on two different planets in two different time periods? The story does not explain that. It really doesn't even try to explain that. It's one of those things where they don't question why they from an in-universe perspective are communicating what the characters know the characters don't know everything so the characters can't tell the viewer everything so what to do with this in a ttrpg ophidian canes definitely one of those exotic technology things you could definitely have players acquire one and screw around with it. It doesn't actually have the ability to do any major feats on its own because it's the activator for the uh, temporal uh, resonance things. Like you need a cave infused with triolic waves. And then the Ophidian um, gets the triolic waves to move in the right pattern in order to create the time. Uh, I, mean, I wouldn't say portal. I'm not sure portal is the right word for it, but temporal distortion effect. Then you, you shift from one place in time to another. To be honest, this is one of those things that I would not give players the ability to just use this for whatever. One of the things that we do know about this is that the Davidians don't seem to be able to arbitrarily target it. Because it's kind of said that that particular site the Davidians were opening the portal from on Davidia is linked to the cave on Earth. What exactly that means is not clear, but it seems to be that they need to have a target that is able to catch the triolic waves. They can't just send them to anywhere they want. And, uh, we don't have rules for that. 
that, that that's the simplest way I can put it. In the show, they don't explain what the actual rules are on how you would connect uh, points like that. It's mentioned that it needs to be done. You need a cavern infused with triolic waves in order to make the Ophidian work. Because the Ophidian isn't actually the source of all of the triolic waves. Something else is, and they don't ever explain what. Like, the Ophidian doesn't actually give off that much energy. And you need a lot of energy. Now, that's an interesting question, because we don't see the Davidians in the process of establishing the connection. We see them use the Ophidian to turn it on and off again after the connection has already been established. So, what exactly is the methodology needed for creating it? <laughs> Again, we don't know. So, as a GM, you would need to um, do something with that. See, if you're just using the Davidians as bad guys and not having players uh, work with it, then... You don't need to g tell the players how to make one. If you don't want the players to make one, don't give them the ability to make one. And of course, you know, having players try to force the, force the Davidians to tell them how to do it. Um, yeah, you can just tell them no. That's honestly the best solution there is just, like, if you don't want the players to do it, tell them no. Uh, also, the whole, like, phase distortion thing, um... It's kind of an interesting thing because it's like a... Being shifted out of phase with normal space is kind of sort of like that thing they do in some episodes with subspace layers. It's like you're being forced closer to a subspace layer than you are in normal space, but you're not all the way in subspace. And realistically, this is something that you could do with other uh, races that aren't Davidians because... As I mentioned in that previous episode with the whole phasing cloak thing, this is the same basic concept as a phasing cloak, except less potent. This is something that's relatively easy to see through if you are looking for it. Now, it is interesting to note that... Um, Actually, properly killing the Davidians with photon torpedoes required them to phase shift the torpedoes. And I mentioned something earlier about the political relationship between the Federation and the Davidians. What Picard does to the Davidians at the end of the episode is pretty much akin to um, Garth of Izar blowing up an entire planet's uh, biosphere. I mean, it's not the same scale. But, as Garth pointed out, one could say that they were adequately or actively hostile to the Federation. Because, yes, the Davidians absolutely were hostile to the Federation. Not that anyone ever actually attempted to negotiate with them or anything like that. Nope, because just blows them up. Again, though, there's like the whole uh, Davidian technology thing borders on magic. And there's so little of it that we don't really get a good grasp on 
the principles by which it works or the methodology required to create it. Because if I remember right, the only tool we actually see them using for any of this stuff is the Ophidian cane. Why exactly we don't see other tools? Um, ask the writers. I don't know. <laughs> because that's one of the things about Davidians that's weird and highly questionable. When we, shots from orbit of Davidia make it look dead and buried, even though it's technically a Class M planet. No sign of life whatsoever. And yeah, this is the cave that they made into a resonation chamber to connect to Earth. And, um... That is what I personally consider to be the most interesting question about the Davidians, is that what's Davidian life like? Again, we don't really know. But it's something that you could have a lot of fun with if you use them in the story. Because we know that there's more than one life form on Davidia. The actual Davidians aren't the only one. They're the only sentient one, apparently. And they're um, pseudo-vampires who absolutely are fine with killing people for food. But we never get to talk to them about that. And that's something I mentioned in the previous video, is that the Federation has had opportunities to deal with the Davidians like this in the past and mostly just avoids them because the Davidians don't seem to have a space fleet and you know um other than that there's not a whole lot to know about them which is a problem as a um person writing a module dealing with Davidians, you are going to need to fill in a lot of blanks if you want to treat them as a full civilization. The episode had them as Monsters of the Week. And while it did make them interesting Monsters of the Week, they have no well-defined home. Because Davidia... It doesn't look like a civilization lives there. <sighs> oh, also this like temporal fragment thing. That that is another thing. It's that um, it the Davidians do apparently have that as some sort of a defense against uh, starships attacking them. So, it's not that they have no ability to affect ships. It's like they could, in theory, uh, project their temporal distortion effects into space. Oh, that's not a big part of this episode, though. In this episode, they're very hands-on. So, you know... And that's about it, I think. Because there's several huge questions here about what the Davidians are, how the Davidians know where to, f uh, how to target Earth. Because the thing that's the biggest question here is how this Davidian pseudo-technology for opening time portals works. And the simple guaranteed to be right answer is the Davidians have technological knowledge the Federation doesn't. How they got it and what they've been doing with it prior to this incident are massive questions that are worth exploring. Not that we know anything, 
but it's fun to think about. What are Davidians? How did Davidians get to be where they are today? Also, uh, what is their natural food? Because it's not human neural energy. Yeah, having them eat the uh, neural energy of a species that doesn't even exist on their planet, that's not their primary food source. It's a food source, apparently, but it's not their natural food source. That's something the episode doesn't go into. The episode never even attempts to explain why they're feeding on human neural energy on Earth. It just says that they are and that, oh, well, the, the, they're bad aliens, therefore we need to stop them. Again, it's one of those things where uh, f finding out the reason is more a matter of interest because you want to um, ensure that they don't do this again, not because you have any sort of sympathy for them. And I think that's about it. Because, like, we have, like, only two named characters as Davidians. It's quite obvious that there's uh, a significant number of them, though. We see several scenes of multiple Davidians in the show. And, um... Unfortunately, that's about where it ends. Because, like, the Federation clearly does not want to wipe out the Davidians. The Federation's stance on the Davidians is that if you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. And, um... While that seems like a simple, easy task for an, a, a race that doesn't have ships, as we've seen with the whole time portals thing, oh boy, uh, you've got questions. Good luck with the answers. Anyway, though, uh, it's something that has fun fun potential in a story it's like it because you know it's a time paradox story where the nature of the time paradox is something a fundamentally sinister thus you have a very very good reason to want to make the time paradox stop and that that is a good story hook all see you guys later